just a word with regard to the books. I, uh, Go Publications has just published uh, my commentary on Galatians, Discovering Christ in Galatians. If you want a copy of it, I would encourage you to get it and study it. I believe the Lord gave me some direction in preparing it. And you want to understand what it is to walk in the Spirit, live before God without the yoke, the oppressive yoke of legal bondage. I would encourage you to get the book and study it. And uh, these books, I don't make a dime on them. Don't want to. Don't take a dime on them. Whatever they cost us from the publishers, that's what we settle them for. And so you can see, please don't see me. See Shelby. I don't like to keep up with anything. All right. Turn with me, if you will, to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This congregation has had a rich, rich, rich history of blessedness. Your pastor, Brother Breedlove, faithfully taught you the gospel. All those years, Brother Farrell came down and preached to you on Thursday evenings. And you've been here now, what, 12, 13 years? Mm. What a tremendous blessing. Brother Mahan has been involved in your lives from the beginning of your existence together as a congregation of believers. And you have been so greatly blessed of God and taught the gospel of God's grace. Sadly, there are many who forsake such a tradition, and by that word I use it in the best possible sense. Paul said with regard to the traditions, sometimes using them evil, sometimes good, but I'm talking about a good tradition, the tradition of the gospel, the tradition of faith in Jesus Christ the Lord, multitudes, multitudes who have enjoyed the same privileges you have enjoyed for many years. Individually and collectively as congregations, abandon those privileges. Abandon the gospel of God's grace. And usually it's little by little through compromise. People, the responsibilities in the pulpit, preachers lead folks astray. Ralph Barnard used to say somebody ought to put a 10 cent bounty on preachers. That might be too high. They just, ah, oh, get so disgusted with preachers. Self-serving preachers. They want to make a name for themselves. They, they want people to follow them. They want to succeed. They want to have folks make professions of faith. And because they don't see God doing what they think God ought to be doing, they start to trim the message. I know many in what's called reform circles. That's another sermon. But <laughs> I know many in what's called reform circles who uh, have begun in the last 10, 12 years to compromise the gospel of God's free grace. Now, let me tell you specifically what I'm talking about. Total depravity. Unconditional election. Particular redemption, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints. These things men compromise and they start to tone down the message a little and uh, bend here and there because they think by compromising the message they can make the gospel more palatable to rebels who hate God and get folks to join the church and follow after them. And the point that is most vital, that which is most vital to the glory of God, that which is most vital to the comfort of God's people, the redeeming work of Christ is where the compromise always begins. That's where it always begins. I know a good many people who 20 years ago stood firmly teaching the accomplished redemption of Jesus Christ at Calvary when he made atonement for our sins and put away our sin by the sacrifice of himself, who today, well, now we've got to restudy that. Anytime you hear a preacher goes in, we've got to start rethinking things. Kiss him goodbye. Just kiss him goodbye. We've got to, we've got to uh, state things differently. Now, you know, there is a sense in which God loves everybody. 
Let me tell you what that means. That means there's a sense in which God's love's not worth spent. There is a sense in which God wants to save everybody. If there is a sense in which God wants to save everybody, there's a sense in which God's will doesn't matter. Well, we believe in common grace. Common grace is useless grace. We believe there's a sense in which Christ... You've got to tell sinners there's a sense in which Christ died for everybody. If Christ died for everybody, in any sense, whatever, his sacrifice is utterly useless and you trust a false Christ. Now, I want this evening to speak to you as plainly, as bluntly, as clearly as I possibly can about the most hideous doctrine in the world. The most hideous doctrine in the world. Somebody said, well, those folks who deny the virgin birth, that's it. No. I'll tell you what gives my soul peace and strength and comfort in the midst of the greatest difficulties more than anything else. It's not God's sovereignty. It's not God's providence. It's not God's election. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Mm. That means everything's all right, no matter how it appears. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That means God won't charge me with sin. The Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. That means he rules the world for me. That means God will with him also freely give me all things. And any attack upon the blessed accomplishments of Jesus Christ as my Redeemer when he laid down my life for me is an attack upon the glory of God. It is an attack upon the faith of the gospel. It is an attack upon my own soul. The most hideous doctrine in the world today and any day is the doctrine of universal redemption. Look here in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 29. Hebrews 10, verse 29. Of how much sorer punishment, how much greater punishment, suppose you, shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, tramples beneath his feet as dirt in the streets, the Son of God. Who does that? And hath counted the blood of the covenant, the blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice by which all the blessings of the covenant are brought home to God's elect, wherewith he was sanctified, that is, the blood he professed to believe in, by which he was outwardly sanctified, He counts that blood now an unholy thing. You get your concordance to look it up. You know what that word unholy means? You can write it out beside it. Common. Ordinary. The blood of Christ was shed in common for everybody. The blood of Christ is something ordinarily given for all men. It's an unholy thing. That which is unholy is unsanctified, it's common, it's ordinary. And those who do so have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now this is what the Spirit of God declares. That man who treads under his feet the Son of God counts the blood of Jesus Christ an unholy thing, counts it a common, ordinary thing. And that which is common, And ordinary is in no sense special. He despises the spirit of grace and he commits the greatest evil in the world and heaps upon himself justly the terrible fury of God's unmitigated wrath. In this message, I want to expose the evil of those who teach that there is a sense in which Christ died for all men. It doesn't matter what degree they say that. It doesn't matter how far they carry that. To suggest that the Son of God laid down his life for somebody who goes to hell 
is to deny the gospel altogether. And there's no excuse for it. Some time ago, I was sitting in my office and I received a call from a young man who had been listening to me on the radio. He politely asked me to send him a copy of the message that he had heard that morning and asked if I would answer four questions for him. These are his questions. He said, Pastor Fortner, what is the doctrine of universal redemption? Second, why do you so strongly oppose that doctrine? Third, what do you believe about the redemption work of Christ? And fourth, why do you believe it? And I sat down that day, put aside what I planned on doing, and spent most of the day answering his questions. I trust God used them for his benefit. After I wrote the letter, I thought to myself, that needs to be preached everywhere. So in this message, I'm going to simply tell you what I told that young man, and I pray God will use it for your soul's good. Again, I repeat, I'm going to speak plainly and distinctly. I, uh, I don't speak with such plainness of speech accidentally. It's on purpose. I want you to know exactly what I'm saying. How many times have you gone and listened to a fellow preach and you say, Well, that's deep. I just couldn't get that. Let me tell you why you couldn't get it. I promise you. If you ever hear me preach, or ever hear that man preach, or any other man preach, you say, well, I don't understand what he said. It's because the preacher didn't want you to understand or because the fool didn't understand what he's talking about himself. One of the two. One of the two. If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? For my part, I'm convinced that ambiguous speech on the part of preachers is both intentional and treasonous. Treasonous to the souls of men and treasonous to the glory of God. One writer of old said the servants of God must not only be for truth, they must also be against error and evil, and that manifestly and always vacillation and weakness of statement are to be deplored. Definiteness of speech is needful. This is what Nehemiah said of the Jews in his day. Their children spake half the speech of Ashdod and could not speak the Jews' language, but according to the speech of the people. And that's just the way it is today. People in our churches half talk like pagans and then throw in a little religious overtones and talk like they believe free grace. Shortly after we built the building where we are in Danville, there was a local preacher who came by. He was attending Louisville Seminary in Southern Seminary at Louisville. And uh, he, uh, you know, did real estate and sold insurance, preached on the side, pastored a large church just down the road. And uh, he said, uh, Brother Fortner... Before he left, he realized I wasn't going to buy anything. He said, uh, tell me, what's the difference in what you preach and what I preach? What your preach church believes and what our church believes. And I said, Doug, have you got a little while? He said, I've got plenty of time. I said, let me ask you if I understand you correctly. I said, if I understand correctly what you preach. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. You believe that when Jesus Christ died at Calvary... He made it possible for all men to be redeemed. He made it possible for all men to be justified. He made it possible for all men to be forgiven of all sin. But he did not actually redeem, justify, or accomplish forgiveness for anyone. But rather that man, by his faith, gives merit and efficacy to the blood of Jesus Christ... For the salvation of his soul, for his redemption, his justification, and his forgiveness. I said, is that what you believe? Is that what you preach? He said, well, yes. I said, that's damning heresy. That's damning heresy. The God you worship and the Christ you preach is nothing but the idolatrous figment of your imagination. He's an utterly useless God and a useless Savior. Utterly useless. Of course, we haven't had much conversation since then. Do you have to be that plain? In Acts chapter 4, 
You remember Peter on one occasion trembled and cussed and denied that he knew the master before a young lady. And he learned something from that experience. God graciously strengthened him by it. In Acts chapter 4, he was imprisoned. And the Jewish Sanhedrin, who had themselves been the ones who had the Son of God crucified, had Peter arrested. And uh, they said, now, we strictly charged you not to preach or teach in this man's name. How dare you do this? And he talked about this man who had been healed, this lame man. And Peter could have said this. He could have said, this man was healed and stands whole before you in the name and by the power of Jehovah, the Lord God of Israel. And you know what he'd have been doing? He'd have been telling the truth and denying God. <laughs> because those Jews would have said, well, amen, brother, that's what we believe. Yeah, we're, we're on the same team. We're going down the same road. Everything's all right with us. But Peter had learned his lesson. He said, if I die, I die, but be it known unto you. And all the people of Israel, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, doth this man stand before you whole. <laughs> That's called the faithful confession of the Redeemer. Now let's look at these four questions. I'll be as brief as I can. Number one. This young man asked me, what is the doctrine of universal redemption? Now I know there's a danger of building up a straw man just to knock it down. And I hope I'm more honest than that. It would be of no profit to anyone for me to do so. I'm going to state this doctrine as plainly and as clearly as I was taught it in two of the most reputable, if you can use the word, reputable to describe them, to the most reputable fundamentalist Baptist Bible colleges in this country that I attended. This is what I was taught. This is what I hear men preach today. I hear them state it from the pulpit. I hear them state it in private conversation. They say the Lord Jesus Christ died for all men, that Christ shed his blood for those who go to hell as well as for those who go to heaven. He did the same thing for one as for the other. They are all the objects of God's grace and love and the objects of Christ's atoning sacrifice. They tell us that Jesus Christ made salvation possible for all men. Doesn't that sound wonderful? That would be fine to tell men that Christ made salvation possible for them if you were talking to living men who had some ability to complete the work. But the fact is, men are dead in trespasses and in sins. And to declare that Christ made salvation possible for them is to declare there is no hope whatsoever for them. They tell us that man, by his faith, gives merit to the blood of Christ. That man's faith makes the blood of Christ effectual for the atonement of sin. I've often heard this illustration used. The atoning work of Christ is like dynamite. And the dynamite is there. All the power is there. It just takes your faith to ignite the fuse and give it power. <laughs> In other words, the sacrifice of Christ is useless without you. His atoning work makes no atonement without you. His putting away of sin is a fabrication until you make it true. We're told that man makes Christ's blood effectual. Shelby and I were driving out of town one Sunday night. I don't usually listen to heretics. But I turned on the radio and I was going to be driving most of the night and I wanted to get pumped up and that'll do it. Pastor of First Baptist Church in Danville, Kentucky, Albert Giesner. He was there for many, many years. He was coming to the conclusion of his Sunday evening sermon. And he made this statement. And I grabbed it. I said, Shelby, write that down. I don't want to forget it. He said, Jesus loved you. Died for you. 
and has done everything He can to save you. But it will all be vain unless you believe. And with pretended tears, He said, What a shame. It will be that Jesus' death will be in vain for so many. I fully agree. A shame. But not for you. For him. It is a shame that he attempted what he failed to do. A shame that he tried what he could not accomplish. A shame that he wanted what he does not obtain. The shame is his if he's a failure. I once heard Jerry Falwell make this statement. If you go to hell, you will go to that awful place in spite of the fact that God himself has done everything he possibly could to save you. Now I'm going to tell you as plainly as I know how. Either those men have no clue who God is or I have no clue who God is. It can't possibly be that both of us know and worship the same God. That's a fair, honest statement of the doctrine of universal redemption. And I've shown God's enemies all the kindness I intend to show them. I've done better than they will. I've honestly presented their doctrine. I ask you to consider some questions. Would you suppose the Son of God laid down his life for a people for whom he refused to pray? I, I just have a hunch that if you had a choice of either praying for somebody or dying for them, you'd pray for them first. Right, that, that pretty reasonable? I believe you would. And the Lord Jesus said twice in John 17, I pray not for them. I pray not for the world. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. I pray not for these alone, but for them also who shall believe on me through their word. I ask you to consider this. Would the Lord Jesus, who is infinitely wise, shed his blood to redeem multitudes who were already eternally damned in hell? Judas was already in hell. The sons of Korah were already in hell. The inhabitants of Sodom were already in hell. To suggest that Christ laid down his life, died for, and made atonement for folks who were already in hell is absolutely ludicrous. Would the God of glory... Sacrifice the son of his love to die in the place of a people who he positively declares to be the objects of his hatred. What did he say about Pharaoh? He said, I raised Pharaoh up for one reason, to dump his carcass in the Red Sea so that everybody would know I'm God. The only reason I put him on the throne. What did he say concerning Esau? Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Now, if you can figure out a way to make that loved a little less, I'll, uh, I'll pay you pretty good for that. The word is hated. And to suggest that God Almighty took the son of his heart's infinite love and sacrificed him for the object of his determined hatred is utterly, utterly ludicrous. All right, here's the second question. Second question the fellow asked. Why do you so strongly oppose that doctrine of universal redemption? The teaching that Christ died for all men, for those who perish in hell, as well as for those who are saved by God's grace. I oppose it because it is more harmful to the souls of men than any doctrine in the world. I speak strongly, but deliberately. I reject the doctrine of universal redemption, universal atonement, call it whatever you will, as absolute damning heresy. I denounce it as the most hideous doctrine that has ever been perpetrated out of hell. It is that doctrine that denies the very deity of Jesus Christ the Lord. It denies that Jesus Christ is himself God, for it declares that Jesus Christ is a failure. The Lord Jesus, our Savior, could not possibly have shed his blood to redeem those who are not redeemed, to save those who are not saved, to forgive those who are not forgiven, to justify those who are not justified. And I'll give you five reasons. Number one, this doctrine, the universal redemption, declares that there is no power, no merit, no efficacy 
in the blood of Christ without man's contribution. Nothing to it unless you believe. Nothing to it unless you make your decision. Nothing to it unless you contribute your part to the work. That means that man is his own savior. The word of God everywhere limits the design, the extent, and the purpose of the atonement. Now, let me be crystal clear. The word of God everywhere limits the atoning work of Christ to God's elect. It is designed for God's elect. It was executed for God's elect. It accomplished the redemption of God's elect. Well, y'all limit the atonement. The Arminian will worshiper. And that's what Paul calls them. Let's get it right. Those folks who, who deny the gospel of God's grace are will worshipers, not God worshipers. Will worshipers, not Christ worshipers. And they limit the atonement. They limit its power, its worth, its merit, and its efficacy. And thus deny the very deity of our Savior. The doctrine of universal redemption. The notion that Christ died for all men, those who are damned as well as those who are saved, makes the grace of God nothing but a frustrated passion in God. People talk about God's grace as, uh, as one of his attributes. And certainly goodness and grace is an attribute in God. When we talk about God's grace as related to salvation, grace is not an attribute, Pastor, it's an act. <laughs> How many times have you gone to visit a friend in the hospital and you uh, look at your friend who's in horrible straits and looks like this man or woman is dying and you take them by the hand and with sincerity you say, if there's anything I can do, anything. And you mean, if there's anything I can do, I'll do it, anything. And by making the statement, you're confessing, there's nothing I can do. That's how men in religious circles, in fundamentalist, conservative churches, Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, Campbellite churches, uh, Catholic churches, any kind of churches. That's how they portray the grace of God. The Lord God, He wants to save you. He's... He's ready to save you. If there's anything he can do, he will. That's not the language of this book. The scripture declares not what God wants to do, but what God's done. The scripture don't present salvation as something God wants to perform, but that which God Almighty has performed. It's his finished work. It was finished before the world began. Executed at Calvary and brought home to our souls in the experience of grace in the new birth and in the gift of faith. And anything less is not the gospel of God's grace. Third, this theory of universal redemption perverts the character of God. It reduces God's glorious attributes to nothing but meaningless words. Let me see if I can illustrate it for you. It reduces the love of God to nothing. <laughs> to nothing. I've got a six-year-old grandson. Now, let's just suppose he's down here with me and we're out here tomorrow afternoon horsing around as we do when we get together. And uh, he gets running out toward the street, going out to the highway. He kicks his football out there and he runs to chase it down. And I look at him and I say, Wilson, don't go to the highway. You might get hurt. And he just ignores me and keeps on running. And I say, Will, please don't go to the highway. You're going to get run over, son. And I'm just standing there hollering at him. And uh, he ignores me, keeps running. And, Will, son, don't go to the highway. Lester slapped me on the head and said, go get him. Oh, I couldn't do that. What do you mean you can't do that? Oh, I love him too much to interfere with his will. What stupidity. What stupidity. Love, love is commitment to the good of its object. And love that has the power to save, will save. And if God loves everybody, he'll save everybody. 
If he doesn't save everybody, it's because he never loved everybody. The doctrine of universal redemption perverts the wisdom of God, turns it into ignorance and foolishness. Who makes plans he knows will never be carried out? Who pays for what he knows he will never obtain? And it makes a mockery of God's justice. More than all else in the scriptures, the sacrifice of Christ at Calvary is presented to us as a matter of divine righteousness, justice, and truth. More than anything else, by mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. It is that God may be just and the justifier of the ungodly that Christ died. He says because of Christ's sacrifice, I am now a just God and a Savior. But justice is a mockery. It is an utter mockery. If Christ paid the debt of my sins and God demands that I pay it too. Payment God cannot twice demand. First at my bleeding surety's hand and then again at mine. The notion of universal redemption reduces the power of God to a helpless, withered arm waiting for man's omnipotent will to revive it by an act of his mighty decision. And it completely denies the immutability of God's mercy, his love, and his grace. God loves everybody. God's gracious to everybody. God's merciful to everybody. You must recognize that. How can you preach the gospel if you don't recognize that? Well, let me ask you something. What happens when they go to hell? Does God still love them? Is he still merciful to them? Is he still wanting to save them? Oh, no. No, we couldn't say that. So in order to magnify and exalt man and his free will, you're willing to sacrifice the character of God Almighty and declare that the unchanging God, after all, is as mutable and mutable and fickle as you? And that's what it means. It robs God of his glory to suggest that Christ died for those who actually perish in their sins anyway. The Lord God Almighty tells us, that He chose us, He blessed us, He loved us, He predestinated us, He accepted us, He redeemed us, and He forgave us. He called us by His grace, and He preserves us by His grace. And three times in the first 14 verses of Ephesians, He said He did it for the praise of the glory of His grace. And if He doesn't accomplish that which is His intent, there's no praise to Him and no glory to Him because there's no grace in Him that really matters. Universal redemption, fourthly, makes the work of Christ a futile exercise, a waste. It makes the precious blood of Christ nothing more than a wager, a bet, a gamble in which God Almighty wagered his glory and the life of his own darling son, his blood and his righteousness upon the will of man. If Christ died for all and all are not saved, then that awful absurdity must follow that Christ died in vain for some. If Christ died to save all men and all are not saved, then it must be concluded that he failed in his most important work in the mission for which he came into this world. But this is the language of the scriptures. Behold, my servant, he shall not fail. <laughs> he shall not fail. Whatever it is he came to do, he shall not fail. And I say to any man, any church, any denomination, any preacher, if the Christ you worship is a failure, the Christ you worship is Antichrist. He shall not fail. Let me give you a direct quote. This is from my first theology professor, Noel Smith. He was an old man when I met him in 1968. I was in Baptist Bible College in Springfield, Missouri. He was professor of biblical interpretation and theology. As he endeavored to describe hell, this is what he wrote.
As I read this, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'd just as soon hear a man say that Jesus Christ was not the virgin-born Son of God. I'd just as soon hear a man say anything. I'd just as soon hear any man stand in this pulpit and cuss. Listen to it. What is hell, he asked. It is an infinite negation. And it's more than that. I tell you, and I say it with profound reverence, hell is a ghastly monument to the failure of the triune God to save the multitudes who are there. I say it reverently. I say it with every nerve of my body tense. Well, they might be. Sinners go to hell because God Almighty himself couldn't save them. He did everything he could. He failed. Trample underfoot the blood of the covenant and do despite to the spirit of grace. If Christ suffered the agony of the cross for all and all are not saved, it shall never come to pass that he shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. What is this but a denial of his deity? A subtle but absolute denial that Jesus Christ really is God. The doctrine of universal redemption is as useless as it is hideous. That's the fifth reason I'm so strongly opposed to it. It offers no real grounds of hope to any sinner. It declares that sin is not pardoned after all. Redemption is not finished, not yet. Atonement is not accomplished, not yet. Not until you make some contribution. It offers no basis of assurance for any believer. If salvation is ultimately determined by my repentance and faith, Christ died for me, that's, that's a given. Christ lived in righteousness for me, that's a given. But it all depends upon me repenting and my faith. Then I must be forever plagued with nagging questions. Have I believed enough? Have I repented enough? What if I lose my mind and I'm not able to go on and I no longer believe him and I no longer repent before him? If salvation depends on me, I cannot possibly have any assurance before God. But God didn't say, when you see the blood, I'll pass over you. He said, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. And the time may come when I lose my mind and in senility of old age, cannot see the blood, but God Almighty saw it before I did. He saw it when I did because he sees it. I see it. And when I can't see it, he still sees it. Christ is still my Redeemer. Though we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. This doctrine, if Christ died for everybody, he shed his life's blood for everybody. He loves everybody. He's gracious to everybody. If that's the case, then you have absolutely no reason to serve him, magnify him, devote yourself to him, or love him. In fact, if he did the same thing for Louis and Don as he did for Judas and Pharaoh, then he ought to give us praise because we're seeking to serve him. If that's the case, who makes you to differ? <laughs> Well, I make myself to differ. That's who does. That's who does. But this is the language of Scripture. What? No, you not. Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own. Don Fortner, you're not your own. Your time, your name, your money, your family the clothes on your back, the house you live in, the car you drive. It's not yours! For you're bought with a price. Tommy Robbins, God did something for you. He didn't do for anybody else. He bought you with his blood. Mm. Let me then glorify God in my body and in my spirit, which are God's and not my own. This young man asked me thirdly, what do you believe about the redemption work of Christ? 
Now hear me well. Our redemption was effectually accomplished by God's darling son when he cried, it is finished. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Nowhere is it written Christ tried or Christ wanted or Christ made possible. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Neither by the blood of bulls and goats or goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. This is the doctrine of Holy Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ died as a substitute in the place of his elect. He hath made him sin for us, that we, by his sacrifice of himself for us, might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Lord Jesus said, I laid down my life for the sheep. He loved the church and gave himself for it. He died in the room instead in place of his seed. I recall years ago, Shelby will remember this, when fellows want to get a little funding, you know, missionaries or they got started a school or a denomination or whatever, they want to raise some money, they, they'll kind of be mushy-mouthed about stuff, and they, they don't want to state things too clearly. We had a missionary in our home, a young man, and he stayed with us for three days, and we talked about this particular subject, particular redemption. And he's sitting on the couch in our den. Shelby was busting around in the kitchen, and his wife standing over there beside her between Shelby and myself. And, and he said, Brother Don, you know, I would believe in limited atonement, if it wasn't for just two or three scriptures to give me trouble. I said, would you repeat that? He said, I would believe in limited tone. It makes perfect sense. If it wasn't for two or three scriptures to give me trouble. I looked at him and called him by name. And I said, you're a liar. And of course, that got everybody's attention. Shelby quit rattling pots and his wife wanted to hit me in the head. <laughs> I said, you're a liar. Now, let me ask you something. Are there two or three scriptures that give you a little trouble about the doctrine of the Trinity? If they're not, I can give you a hundred. There are a bunch of scriptures that you have trouble with about the doctrine of the Trinity. But the whole testimony of this book declares it plainly. And we do not interpret scripture with honesty. If we go to this place or that, pick up this statement or that, so, oh, well, now that didn't fit the whole, whole revelation. We've got to do something with this. You don't deal with any legal document like that. You don't deal with any personal correspondence like that. Only dishonesty makes men deal with scriptures like that. The fact is the whole testimony of scripture is that Jesus Christ, by the sacrifice of himself, with his precious blood, one time forever, put away our sins, and they shall never be charged to his people, because Christ died in our stead. The fact is, no text in all the word of God, there's not one. I defy you to find one that even gives a hint that Christ died for everybody in the world. There's not even a hint that he did so. Everywhere in this book where the death of Christ is dealt with, everywhere his substitutionary work is dealt with, everywhere in this book, be it prophecy, type, or doctrinal statement, everywhere in this book where the redeeming work of Christ is dealt with at all, it is stated specifically for a specific people, God's elect. Everywhere there are no exceptions. By pouring out his life's blood unto death, our Lord Jesus Christ satisfied divine justice for us, made an effectual atonement for the sins of his elect, and put away our sins. <laughs> the sure result of this work that Christ did at Calvary 
is the salvation of every sinner for whom he died. Turn to Isaiah 53 for a moment. Isaiah 53. Verse 10. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. The word is it satisfied Jehovah to bruise him. Nothing else could. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, this is the result. When you make him sin for us, he shall see his seed. He'll see who, he, who they are. He'll see them redeemed and justified and glorified. He shall prolong his days that he's going to rise from the dead. And the pleasure of the Lord, the will of God will prosper in his hand. What's that? He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge. That is, by knowledge of his seed and knowledge of his accomplishments shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore our Savior said, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. And this is the will of him that sent me, that if every one who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Paul says the gospel is this. He says, I delivered unto you the gospel. H-O-W. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. The gospel is not stating that Christ died for our sins. The gospel is the revelation given in this book of H-O-W. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. How was that? Go back and read the Old Testament scriptures and find out. Aaron, the high priest, had a breastplate. And on his breastplate, there were some names written. Anybody know whose names were there? For the whole world, I'm high priest. No. The names of the twelve tribes of Israel were there. They made atonement with the offering of a paschal lamb and the setting free of a scapegoat. Aaron confessed the sins of Israel on the lamb to be sacrificed, slit his throat, offered his blood in the holy place. And he took the scapegoat and laid his hands on the head of the scapegoat and confessed the sins, not of the whole world, but of Israel, God's elect. And he sent that goat off in the hands of a fit man carrying our sins away as Christ our Redeemer did. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament was made for a specific people, for God's chosen and for nobody else. When Moses was commanded to tell the people about the Passover, he said, go tell it in the ears of Israel. Didn't even tell it to the Egyptians. Didn't even tell them. Why? Because it wasn't for them. The sacrifices were lifted up as Christ was lifted up. The sacrifices were offered to God upon God's altar according to God's command. And Christ was offered to God on God's altar according to God's command. The sacrifices were consumed by the fire of God's altar. Christ, as he was consumed by the fire of God's justice and wrath, consumed the wrath of God for us. So that God says to Jacob, fury is not in me. That's called redemption. That's called forgiveness. That's called the putting away of sin by the sacrifice of himself. How did he die for our sins? He died voluntarily as our covenant surety. Before the world was, he stood forth as our surety. And he said, I will redeem them. Lay on me. The responsibility of their sins. Lay on me the responsibility of their transgressions. Lay on me the responsibility of their iniquities. Lay on me the responsibility of all righteousness on their behalf. 
And I will satisfy justice. I will bring in everlasting righteousness. And the scripture says, The Lord God trusted him, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your own salvation. <laughs> and in the fullness of time, the Lord Jesus Christ came here and died as our vicarious sacrifice. Died in the room instead of his people. With one tremendous draft of love, he drank damnation dry. And justice was satisfied. He died as our victorious Savior. He said, it's finished. And took the price of his blood into glory. And sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And the book says we sat down with him. And he says to the father, lo, I and the children whom thou hast given me. That is redemption. And that is God our Savior. Oh, may God give you grace to trust your soul to him. I hang my immortal soul on him alone. On his blood and his righteousness. Not my faith in him. Because my faith in him at best is full of unbelief. Not my obedience to him. Because my obedience to him is at best disobedience. Not my love for him. Because I confess with shameful face. My love for him is at best Love for me. What's your hope? Jesus Christ died for me. I recall years ago, well, the Pharaoh was preaching for me. I was passing look at West Virginia. He was preaching about Christ's rest in the garden. He said the Roman soldiers came. And the Lord Jesus took the initiative. He said, whom seek ye? And they said, we seek Jesus of Nazareth. And the master said, I am. And they fell away as dead men. And uh, he said, all right, that's the way I ain't get up. <laughs> now, who was it you said you were looking for? <laughs> Jesus of Nazareth. I told you, I am he. If you seek me, and he points at Peter and James and John, his disciples, he says, let these go their way. You can have me, but you can't have them. Or you can have them, but you can't have me, but you can't have both. <laughs> and the Son of God says to divine justice, whom seek ye? And he says, take me. And these must go their way. And so his people must go free by the price of his blood. Amen.